Good morning and welcome to OETV. I'm Mehdi Sundarji and I'm joined by Jeffrey Huge, founder of Alpha Insights. We are here live at nine. How are you, Jeff? I am well, Mehdi. Thanks for having me on the show today. Absolutely. Lots to talk about. Um, you obviously published your weekly piece on Sunday night. And it's certainly been uh, a few volatile days since we last spoke this time last Tuesday. Um, there's been increased volatility. We felt like things were going onwards and upwards for a few days there. And then come Friday, um, things started sinking off and it seems to be trending that way further. Um, even our old friend Jamie Dimon um, came out with some commentary yesterday um, in regards to us hitting a, a, a recession in in next several couple of quarters, basically. Things that you've been talking about for a while. So uh, let's dive right into your report and uh, hit the top down. Uh, you know, um, we got a big bounce last week uh, on Monday and Tuesday. Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, we saw a consolidation and a gap down on Friday. So let's not forget that. That leaves an island reversal pattern in play at this point. Um, it's interesting. I mean, you know, we've been looking at this thing for a while, uh, and the setup is very reminiscent of the 1987 setup, although it's at two degrees of trend that are higher than the 1987 degree of trend. Um, you, you know, people that were looking, were, were participating in the market back in 1987 have been commenting, commenting on this uh, publicly. And um, I actually think people are misremembering what's happening. You know, um, even though the market topped in August and crashed in October, um, you know, this is a much larger degree of trend. And so we topped in uh, January uh, and, and came down into the June lows. The rally back into the August highs was a second wave by our work, which puts us in the early subdivisions of a third wave decline. Uh, we count it as a third of a third of a third. So uh, three degrees of trend. And, you know, we'll be uh, certain about that uh, once the S&P 500 makes a new low that takes out the September lows. Um, by the way, the NASDAQ 100 already took out those lows uh, modestly yesterday, but uh, albeit, uh, you know, uh, it, it occurred. And so, you know, I don't think the s and is far behind. Uh, what will happen is you'll see this uh, total synchronicity of the markets as we break below these September lows and what I believe will be um, a terrific plunge into uh, what we're expecting to be, you know, somewhere in the mid 2000s in S&P terms. Uh, our work suggests 2750 to 2400 uh, is an optimal range for our uh, primary wave three decline to bottom. Uh, before we get any sort of selling reprieve. Uh, we have been adamant uh, with our uh, clients about uh, maximizing their cash reserves into this. We don't think there's anywhere to hide in risk assets at this point. And uh, you know, minimizing net equity exposure to the extent your mandate will allow. Understood. You have certainly been consistent on it. And, uh, you know, I will say no one likes to hear the word terrific and plunge in the same sentence unless you're an <laughs> Olympic swimmer. So, uh, you know, we'll keep on watching for these things. Jeff, um, looking through your chart book this week, um, you put out an interesting chart, the, the chart of the moving balance indicator. What is this telling us? Because I, I haven't seen this before. This is old school. This is Humphrey Lloyd's Moving Balance System from 1976. He published a book on it. I did not read the book, but my old boss, Steve Luthold, was very fond of, um, you know, really eccentric sort of indicators of this nature. And uh, this, this uh, particular indicator was tested extensively at the Luthold Group. And, um, you know, my familiarity with the work that was done there uh, gives me confidence that this is a very reliable breath thrust indicator. And the reason that we publish this chart in our weekly is that, you know, uh, we've been hearing a lot of market watchers talking about a breadth thrust every time we get an 80% upside day in the market. I mean, it's exhausting uh, because they're so frequent, right? And these breadth thrusts that are, you know, presumed to uh, occur, you know, seem to be fading pretty fast. And so, you know, I thought it would make sense just to kind of inform our clients um, about what a real breadth thrust looks like. And, and frankly, you know, this indicator is probably the most 
uh, credible that I've seen. And, and a real credible breadth thrust is when the 10-day moving average of the moving balance indicator exceeds 75%. And we have not seen that since uh, really uh, June 5th of 2020 was the last time. And the time before that was January 10th, 2019. And we know what happened following those. We saw big follow-on moves to the upside and, and new highs, right? And so uh, we're not seeing anything uh, to that effect. Uh, you know, we're at uh, 55% was the highest reading we saw that's come down quite a bit. Uh, but, you know, I am not confident that um, the, you know, bread thrusts that are being discussed in, you know, kind of uh, the public square, if you will, um, with respect to uh, market volume is something that we should be paying attention to. We're just not seeing it in uh, reliable indicator, indicators of this nature. And uh, until we do, you know, we're gonna be skeptical of that work. Okay, so uh, this is kind of just to refute a lot of the commentary that's out there from the talking heads. Um, let's talk about, vol uh, not volatility, about uh, liquidity. You touched on it there for a moment as well. Liquidity has been a very large topic of conversation recently. People are saying, I just can't get anything done in this market. And uh, it looks like you're seeing the same. Yeah, it's tough to say um, if it's drying up or not, right? You know, because most of the volume takes place off board these days. Uh, but if we just, you know, take a cursory look at, you know, uh, listed and over-the-counter exchange volumes, we can come to this conclusion. Liquidity is no longer expanding. And, uh, you know, I think, you know, if you take a look at the market, our own experience says that uh, the bid side of the market is an inch deep and a mile wide, right? And uh, anybody who's been out there trying to move size knows that. Um, so, you know, I am a little bit concerned that there is going to be kind of a void or a vacuum uh, if it comes to, you know, uh, a mass exodus, uh, you know, where people are headed for the exits, exits there just won't be any bids. Uh, we're seeing it in the credit markets. Um, there's no question the credit market liquidity has dried up dramatically, especially uh, structured credit. Uh, Jamie Dimon, you know, you pointed uh, to his comments about the equity markets. He was uh, much more clear about the credit markets at this point. And, um, you know, I think that liquidity in the real estate market is dead. Uh, you know, unless you were to bring your uh, levels down 20%, you're not going to get a, a transaction done. Uh, and so, you know, my thinking is that, uh, you know, the equity market will be maybe the last domino to fall in terms of liquidity. Uh, but we're already seeing the trend in that direction. Well, rolling on from liquidity, we also, there's been a lot of topics around um, the Fed balance sheet reduction. Um, this is a great looking, well, it's not a great looking chart, but it's a very indicative chart of what, what what's happening out there. And people really aren't seeming to absorb the severity of this. It is telling. And this uh, work comes from uh, uh, global research at uh, B of A. And uh, frankly, you know, their economics department has calculated that uh, during the COVID panic, Central banks pumped $7 trillion in incremental liquidity into the market, you know, uh, expanding their balance sheets by $7 trillion in aggregate. Uh, the U.S. Uh, was about $4 trillion of that. And so, um, you know, my thinking at this point is uh, looking at the runoff that we've seen and uh, based on their calculations, last seven months saw more than $3 trillion of that, uh, you know, expanded liquidity uh, you know, contract back uh, to uh, where it came from. And um, the interesting thing about that is most of it's been the Bank of Japan and the ECB. And uh, that happens to be where we're starting to see some, some uh, th these tighter um, conditions, liquidity conditions, if you will, and credit conditions are starting to manifest. Uh, you know, it showed up in uh, the UK and the pension plans. We're seeing it in a number of... Uh, uh, European banks uh, with balance sheets being stressed beyond what uh, many people thought even imaginable. Um, I think the fragility of the European financial system, be it the banking system or the structured credit markets or even the pension systems over there should not be underestimated. And, um, you know, a lot of people are looking at the U.S. market saying, hey, you know, consumers balance sheets are flush. I think that's debatable. Uh, the consumer is strong. There's spending going on. Yeah, there's spending going on, but you know it's uh, being 
funded by credit uh, for the most part at this point. Uh, you know, savings rates have collapsed, but people aren't looking at what's going on in Europe. And, uh, you know, there's panics at the gas station. It's uh, reminiscent of 1973 in France. You pull up to the, uh, uh, you know, the, the local gas station and the police are there measuring the contents of your tank. And if you're too full, they're going to send you packing. Um, so, you know, it's, it's come to that. Uh, there is a definite energy crisis. Uh, Diamond referenced the fact that Europe's already in recession. I think there's no question that Europe's already in recession. Um, is the U.S. in recession? We'll find out. Um, you know, third quarter GDP is looking like it's shaping up well. Uh, but, you know, this continued runoff in uh, central bank balance sheets is going to have an impact. And, and the Fed has been the last one to jump on the bandwagon here. Um, we have seen uh, since about April 13th, when the Fed's balance sheet peaked, about $206 billion dollars come out of the Fed's balance sheet. So that is expected to accelerate uh, to a rate of around 95 billion a month going forward. And we just heard from Charles Evans, who's an alternate voting member on the FOMC uh, out of Chicago. And uh, you know, his view is that you know, we could see the Fed's balance sheet run completely off over the next three years. So uh, that's a big liquidity drain coming out of the market and annualized terms um, it's been estimated that that could be an incremental 50 to 100 basis points of tightening. So, you know, we'll see how that affects, um, you know, the U.S. economy in the not too distant future. Jeff, let's have a look at the uh, the shorter term scenarios, because, you know, you already used the term terrible plunge, but it felt like things were getting a little bounced mid last week. And then suddenly things started angling off quite aggressively. So, uh, you know, I guess a uh, terrible plunge it is. Yeah, I said terrific. I probably terrific. should have said sorry, terrible. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I guess it depends, you know, whether you're an artist, observer, spectator, or participant, right? <laughs> uh, but at the end of the day, you know, we're looking at this decline, this island reversal that we've circled in red in the chart. And, you know, as long as that gap is not filled, this is one of the most bearish patterns uh, that, you know, you can, you can, um, uh, you know, draw inference from. And, you know, the, the real inference will be that, you know, it is kicking off, uh, you know, a third wave decline uh, at minor degree and a break below that September low uh, will confirm that. Um, you know, this, again, I said this before, the setup is very reminiscent of the 87 crash. It's just much larger degree, two degrees of trend larger. And so once we break below that September low, I would expect panic to ensue. Uh, I would expect uh, volatility to spike much higher. We've been talking about this for a while. I don't think I put a, a chart of the VIX in. I can't remember, honestly. Maybe, maybe we did, but I expect it to pop. And, uh, you know, that would all be, you know, kind of coalescing upon this breakdown below the September low, which could happen at any time. We've got a lot of news coming out. We've got PPI. We've got Fed minutes. We've got the CPI. And then we've got a slew of bank earnings on Friday, which, in my opinion, would be a perfect day for the market to break to the downside. Uh, maybe the CPI comes in a little ahead of uh, expectations or better than expectations, I mean, and that gives us a little bit of a reprieve from the selling and then the bank earnings come. And I do not expect bank earnings to be, um, you know, anything to write home about. If, if anything, I think we're gonna start to see what's going on in the credit markets materialize uh, in uh, bank earnings reports. And, um, you know, that could be the harbinger of, of what is to come, uh, the catalyst, if you will, for the next big leg down. And, and where could that end? Well, you know, we talk about that in our Elliott Wave analysis. Well, that's, uh, that rolls us into the Elliott Wave side of things. You've got, uh, you've been bringing this chart up uh, week in, week out. Yeah, it's just, you know, we're updating it and, you know, it's, uh, it's progressing exactly as expected. Um, you know, we, we caught some support at the 200 week exponential moving average. And uh, many people thought that was the bottom. Uh, that was the bottom of primary wave one down. And uh, the rally into the August 16th highs was primary wave two up. That counter trend advance terminated and we rolled over hard down. We've now taken out the June lows and uh, you know the September lows so far count as at least intermediate wave one and minor wave one down. So, you know, we're, we're counting one, two, one, two, one, two. The next break will be three, 
and three at minor degree, expanding to intermediate degree, expanding to primary degree. So, you know, these subdivisions have just an incredible, um, powerful impact on the market's direction because you just don't get any sort of a sustained counter trend move uh, at these smaller degree um, uh, subdivisions. So, you know, if our work is correct, uh, we should see uh, primary wave three carry to at least 2750, which would represent a 50% retracement of this advance off the 2009 low through the Jan 22 high, that 13 year monthly view that we're showing right now. Um, but that might not hold. Um, we actually uh, did some additional work uh, projecting using um, our, our primary wave one decline uh, as kind of the um, uh, determinant. And if we look at 161.8% uh, of the primary wave one decline from the August 16th high, that actually carries down to 2,400. And that is a very common um, you know, relationship between these waves. So you know, um, let's take a look at a, a smaller or blown up a picture of what that looks like. And, and you can kind of see how these subdivisions are breaking down here. And so you know, our view is once we get into that uh, 2,750 to 2,400 range, we should find a durable low. Um, you know, the question is, well, when will that occur? Well, you know, we've been looking at these dates uh, for some time. Uh, they're Montgomery turn dates. Uh, Montgomery, Paul Mac McRae Montgomery was a great cycle analyst. Uh, and his work suggests that we have a major Montgomery cycle turn date on um, October 25th, which I think could be the bottom for primary wave three. Um, and he has another one at November 8th, which, um, you know, hopefully that's not the top of wave four. We get a little bit more carry before the next move down, but, you know, it could be. And uh, I've just kind of said we've got this window between, you know, October 25th and November 8th that we need to be cognizant of these two weeks where, you know, a bottom could form. Uh, and then we need to kind of be on alert for the next move, whether, you know, it's a lateral consolidation, which uh, we've been ad advocating for a primary wave for just because we had a really steep, um, sharp zigzag rise for wave two. Elliot's rules of alternation suggest that wave four should be the opposite of that. So it should be a little more drawn out, should be shallower. And then a final plunge, a fifth wave plunge into uh, the lows, which, you know, we expect to occur, you know, no later than Q1 2023. Uh, and that fifth wave low could carry the S&P 500 down as low as 2250 based on this work, which would coincide with the 618 retracement of that 13 year advance off the 2009 lows. It also coincides with a prior um, uh, fourth wave extreme uh, at primary degree. And it also coincides with the 200 month moving average, which is advancing into that range. So um, we think all of that should um, provide some support for the market, uh, you know, durable support, where we could stage um, a more significant counter trend uh, advance from. And that counter trend would likely be uh, a B wave. Um, so we're counting this entire five wave decline into that, you know, 2250 as motive wave. A cycle wave A down, and it would be followed by counter trend wave B up, which could retrace up to 50% of that. So, you know, we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. Right now, we're focused on the immediate move, primary wave three down, which we think should be hard down between now and uh, at least November 8th. And for our viewers, I just want to highlight that the two Montgomery cycle dates are October the 25th and November the 8th, and they happen to be Tuesdays, and we will be coming live in two weeks and four weeks, respectively. So I would urge you to tune in 9 a.m. on Tuesdays here at YouTube and OETV. So, you know, Jeff will have his updated thoughts then. Um, rolling through, Jeff, um, let's talk about internals. I feel like this is Groundhog Day. It's like, can they get worse? Um, and apparently they can. Yeah, you know, we said no bueno last time. We we upgraded that to we no bueno. Um, they are getting worse. You know, indeed, uh, we've seen the five-week moving average of net advancing issues turn hard down. Uh, now appears poised to ch challenge the May lows. Uh, so, you know, we'll keep our eyes peeled there. Momentum, which is the uh, center uh, frame, 
uh, you know, we're, we're looking at a five week RSA oscillator and that broke below the median line and is now holding below oversold. Uh, so oversold territory in momentum terms is really um, the empirical evidence of institutional selling. And that does not appear to be abating in our view. And, and then the final uh, lower frame um, down volume was 93. I think 93 and a half percent or something of total volume. This is S and P 500 volume, not not exchange volume. But um, you know, we look at a five week moving average of the ratio of up down volume, and that has been kind of hovering in the two and a half times uh, area. But a lot of that is um, the big volume spike that we saw five weeks ago. So I expect next week, unless, we, unless we're totally wrong about everything and we get a big up volume week uh, in the next week, um, then you know, that should roll over hard down as well. So I don't really see uh, in, internals as being anything other than bearish for uh, the market going forward. And investor sentiment, like speaking to investors, everyone just seems to be confused, little shell shot, little deer in headlights, and it just seems to be getting worse and worse. We, we titled this uh, slide whack-a-mole because every time investors stick their heads up, you know, uh, the market whacks them and, and knocks them back down again. So, you know, we've, we've been measuring these surveys, uh, the professional survey, which is the National Association of Active Investment Managers, the name exposure index, that's the upper frame. And, you know, that has gotten down to like, uh, oh, I think um, 38 uh, percent. It's at now it was even lower than that. It was down into the teens. Right. But it's it's, you know, reared its head again. Right. And, and I think, you know, that probably was Monday and Tuesday of last week. And you know, come Friday, um, you know, the market whacked them on the head again and sent them back down. Um, you know, the individual investors have been a little less aggressive about sticking their head up out of the sand lately. Uh, we continue to see the uh, the bull bear spread. So bulls minus bears at minus 31. So there's uh, very few people registering uh, on the individual investor side as being bullish, about 24%. Yet about 55% of individuals uh, surveyed suggest that they're in the in the bear camp. So that negative 31% is the spread. And uh, that's been lower. That's gotten down into the, you know, minus 44% level. So it's, it's come back from the depths of despair. But again, you know, uh, the survey data came out on Wednesday, I think last week, and, and Friday was the whack-a-mole day, sent them all, uh, you know, reeling. And so I suspect this week's uh, survey will probably, you know, uh, prove out to to be that you know people have, have uh, retrenched in terms of their um, uh, sentiment again uh, to you know the extremes. But you know a lot of people have thought about well look how bearish um, you know the survey data is coming in. Everybody's bearish. Um, that means that I should be bullish. Well, at the bottom it does mean that, right? But how do you know we're at the bottom? We're not. Okay. Um, it can get worse, right? It's been worse and it can get worse. And so uh, we're not big believers in, you know, trying to trade every twist and turn in investor sentiment as it, you know, kind of vacillates between uh, overdone and underdone, um, especially in a bear market. I think investor sentiment tends to get glued to bearish in a bear market because, you know, people are just staring at the market like a deer in the headlights and they don't know what to do. They're frightened. And uh, it's not a time to throw caution to the wind. It's not a time to you know, bet against uh, the consensus in a bear market. You want to see extreme uh, market action. You want to see a breath thrust, and we're not seeing it. So, Jeff, there is one thing that seems to be on the rise, but uh, it's volatility. Ah, yes, I did put a chart on volatility in the deck this week. All right. It's all running together. Um, you know, the trend is up in volatility. We've been saying this for a long time. Uh, you know, this pattern kind of looks like an inverted head and shoulders base formation. I know a lot of people say you can't chart the VIX. Um, I don't really chart it, but I'm a trend follower, right? And the trend is telling me two things. Number one, volatility is above that 24% level that is in the past kind of acted as, as a boiling point for volatility. When you're above 24, it tends to go higher. And uh, that's exactly what we've seen. In fact, we've seen it begin to trend above its 21 day moving average, which has also been 
you know, a characteristic of volatility leading up to volatility spikes. And, and I think we can go higher. I think that uh, once price starts to break below the September lows, if we start to see the free fall that uh, our work suggests is imminent, uh, then I think volatility will challenge uh, at least the 40% level. We have imprinted a VIX uh, close, actually an intraday VIX uh, print ab above 40% in over two years. I think we will uh, this month. And it wouldn't surprise me to see us print a 50% VIX number this month as well. Wow. All right. So we're all watching volatility. Um, looking at the sector side, any sectors of uh, note? Obviously, you can see energy's had some move, but uh, any anything else that you want to mention for the week? Well, yeah, you know, if this was a stock, soccer stadium and it was OPEC versus the world, you know, the crowd would be going crazy. Ole, 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 right? You know, because OPEC shoots and scores, right? They, they you know, shocked everybody and, and let the world know that they're more important than the Fed. Uh, they're more important than... Uh, the United States of America, and uh, OPEC Plus has decided that they are going to defend the price of oil. Uh, they want the price of oil north of eighty dollars, preferably north of ninety. And uh, you know that uh, uh, you know that piece of information that that view has been made crystal clear at this point, right? And so energy stocks re reacted in kind. And you know, unfortunately, this came after. Uh, you know, month end. And so we didn't have that data when we were doing our sector work uh, and our big monthly. And, um, you know, things were looking a little treacherous for the energy stocks. They were not behaving well. They had broken some key levels that we had been watching closely. And, um, you know, as a result, we downgraded the energy sector to neutral from bullish, um, you know, a week too early. And I apologize uh, for that, but, you know, that is the nature of markets, right? So, you know, if I were writing that report today, I would not have downgraded energy and we'll probably end up upgrading it back to bullish next month uh, or next quarter, whenever we publish that uh, uh, piece again. But at the end of the day, I think, um, you know, investors should take this information uh, seriously. And, uh, you know, we've seen a massive uh, upside move in energy stocks. Um, I throw, you know, a whole handful of names out there uh, in, in, the, in, you know, the reports that we're publishing. So, you know, if you want to subscribe and, and learn what we're thinking about, then, you know, um, feel free to do so. I'd be happy to share it with you. Well, and as a little taster for the subscribers uh, or non-subscribers, you know, let's make some money in this market. Yeah, um, exactly. So on the bull side, we did throw two of them into our top actionable trade uh, ideas this week. Denberry, which looks like it's going to be acquired by Exxon based on the chatter in the market. The other one is Hess. Uh, we're choosing Hess to uh, talk about today, mainly because Denberry had a huge move. And we're probably a little late to that party uh, at this point. But uh, investors who got our note on Sunday night would have had an opportunity to participate in that and probably will make a good uh, sum of money on it. Uh, Hess looks like it's a more natural breakout play. And, um, you know, we like the stock above 130. It went out last night at 127. You know, if the market gets hammered, nothing's going to go up. And so this probably won't work. But if Hess can break out and hold sustainably above 130, that small degree, you know, cup and handle type base, you know, classic pattern base formation will resolve to the upside and projects a number to about $170 a share. Um, we like 116 as a stop loss. Once we get that breakout, that gives us a 3-1 uh, positive risk skew on the trade. Um, Jeff, what about on the short side? Yeah, so, so Hess was 30% upside. LAM Research is our short pick this week. Um, I think the downside could be, you know, epic, uh, you know, just to put it that way. I think when, when, the, when the stock starts to break down like it has, um, you know, the breakdowns can be powerful. It, it will blow people's minds when they see how fast the stock will fall once this thing gets going. Uh, the stock went out around 350 down, I think four, five, six percent yesterday, like 25 bucks. Um, you know, we published this chart this Sunday night. The stock was trading at 375. We said the breakdown below this 375 level counts initially to 225. 
But this is a very large degree inverted cup and handle top formation, which could go into the double digits. We're in triple digits now. We could get into the sub $100 levels uh, before the stack finds its, bo its bottom. Um, so, you know, we think that the downside could be, you know, considerably better uh, in LAM research than the upside is in HESS. Uh, and, you know, that kind of jives with our overall market view. Uh, we would uh, use a stop loss based on where the stock went out last night at 390. And that gives us a three to one positive risk view in the trade. It's a very scary looking chart there. Uh, one to keep on the radar. Jeff, as always, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts from Alpha Insights. It's always eye opening. Always a pleasure, Matty. And I want to thank our viewers for watching, taking the time, and good luck investing out there.